I want to welcome you to Green College. First, let me recognize that we're on the unceded, ancestral, and occupied territories of the Musqueam people. Uh, as many of you know, there's a long process of reconciliation occurring in Canada, and, and we're part of that, very much part of that uh, process. Um, so I'm delighted to, to welcome so many new faces. This is the first session of a workshop on standpoint theory, and I'm sure it's going to be really exciting. It's going to go on f uh, tomorrow and Saturday, and Alison was telling me there were about 20 uh, p people enrolled or registered in, in the workshop. Uh, Alison Wiley is the organizer, and it's appropriate that she would be, given that she's a member of the common room here at Green and a member of the advisory board. Sort of as an aside, I, I, it's important, it seems, I, I was thinking about how important this theory has been. Uh, from Really from the late 1980s, early 90s, it's been enormously uh, important in, uh, in the humanities and social sciences in a widespread sense. Almost every discipline has been influenced by this theory. Not least my own field, which is the sociology of education. Uh, key scholars, Sandra Harding, Donna Haraway, uh, and, and um, who else was I thinking of? Oh, Dorothy, Dorothy Smith. Uh, all, all three have been enormously influenced in my own field, uh, changing, of course, as you would expect, the perspective of sociologists, as in this case, study education, but it could be anything. There are scholars here visiting from, uh, as part of the workshop from the US, from the Netherlands and from England, so we welcome you especially, uh, but welcome to you all, and I wish you great success, Alison. Thank you, Don. So it's a huge pleasure to um, introduce uh, our first speaker, uh, Sally Haslanger. Um, and I just want to thank you all for coming out for, for Sally's uh, Green College lecture. As Don said, this is the opening keynote. Uh, it serves also as opening keynote for the workshop that we've been organizing. Um, and I particularly want to thank Green College for all the support you've given us to make this workshop possible. Hosting Sally, giving us this space, which we'll be in tomorrow, alongside Philosophy Department, which will be hosting us on Saturday. So. Thanks to all of them. Um, Don already gave you a land acknowledgement. Um, the traditional UBC one is that we acknowledge we're gathered on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And land acknowledgements are now pretty standard practice, well, absolutely standard practice at UBC. Um, but they should never be just a formality. What we're acknowledging is a history of colonial dispossession and indigenous survivance. Uh, and that's one group uh, thinking along those lines. Those are crucial uh, kinds of impetus for the work that we'll be doing over the next couple of days as philosophers interrogating the epistemic effects of oppression, recognizing the wisdom of those who have been and continue to be marginalized by conditions, practices, and institutions that entrench systemic oppression. Um, so I wanted to consider for a moment what's at stake in each of the components of the standard acknowledgement. Traditional marks the fact that these lands have been home territory for the Musqueam for millennia, uh, something that the Musqueam have always known. I do a lot of work with archaeologists, something that archaeologists are able to document quite persuasively, but it's not news to Musqueam. Ancestral recognizes that these lands have been handed down from generation to generation according to indigenous laws and traditions of self-governance and stewardship that safeguard the health of the land and all connected to it. Unceded means exactly what it sounds like. These lands were never turned over to the crown by treaty or any other agreement. So we're on occupied territory here as settlers. If you're workshop presenters, participants from away, um, I urge you to take a stroll down Main Mall so you just like would go straight up that hill and head, head south. <laughs> Um, and then uh, when you get about a third of the way down Main Mall, there's University Boulevard intersects it, and as you approach the bus loop, you'll see the Musqueam post um, that stands at the bottom of a kind of water feature, running water feature, 
down University Boulevard. It was carved by Brent Sparrow, a Musqueam carver, and tells the origin story of the name Musqueam. It marks an appreciation uh, that this promontory of land where UBC is located has, on the understanding of Musqueam, has always been a place of learning for the Musqueam over many generations. So I want to recommend that you take a walk if you've got the time and check out what's, what's uh, you know, ways in which Musqueam are present on, on this territory, on their territory. Our speaker this evening, Sally Haslanger, is well known to many of you as a philosopher who started out doing what I think of as high church metaphysics. <laughs> Are you looking in there? Okay, that's it. high church metaphysics. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and epistemology, but soon found ways to bring these conceptual analytic tools and, uh, to bear on questions that arose from Sally's long standing feminist activist commitments. I remember, an, I'm going to embarrass you, I remember an APA session, I think it was a SWIFT session, probably the early 90s, and it was a whole group of really, uh, you know, more senior than us uh, yeah. feminists who've been pioneering feminist ethics and political theory. And they're all talking about how they bring philosophy and <laughs> feminism together. And we were saying, well, it's kind of a struggle for you at that point. Yes. On the one hand, the metaphysicians were saying, like, what's a nice girl like you doing hanging out with these feminists? <laughs> and on the other hand, the feminists were saying, what's a good, solid feminist like you doing high church <laughs> metaphysics? Yeah. And within just a couple of years, you started doing the work that you're now best known for, which, was, which really brought those together in ways that have transformed our field quite profoundly. You were, first of all, uh, writing, as I remember, on questions about norms of objectivity that are central to dominant conceptions of reason, of rationality, uh, but are by no means neutral, that effectively legitimate gendered practices, as you were analyzing them then, of objectification. This is a, from a, like an, a, a really influential 1993 article on being objective and being objectified, which gets a lot, still gets a lot of uptake and is relevant in all kinds of ways. And then Sally moved on to work more specifically on questions about concepts of race and gender. How these not only reflect, but also actively constitute and entrench systems of gender, race, class, privilege, uh, and subordination. This work of Sally's, as I said, has been pivotal um, in transforming and fostering a quite distinctive new genre of social ontology that never loses sight of the political and material consequences of the cultural practices by which we name and conceptualize one another and the world we occupy, we inhabit. The title of Sally's 2012 collection of essays, Resisting Reality, captures her commitment to active engagement that animates all her work, this commitment to active engagement. As the title, subtitle of her talk today makes clear, the point of this engagement, of this close analysis of ideologies that underpin extant social conventions, is to inform action, to co-design critical social interventions. It's an emancipatory project. So with that, I turn this over to Sally. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. So can everybody hear me OK? If anybody uh, stops being able to hear me, just raise your hand and let me know. Um, I have a handout. I'm not going to follow along on the handout. It's there mainly because one of the things I don't like about PowerPoint presentations is that people leave the slides behind that I need to go back to to kind of put the argument together and think what's going on. <clears throat> <laughs> okay. Handouts. Okay. Okay. And we'll circulate. Sorry that we didn't do this before. Thank you. That was a, that was such a sweet introduction. Thank you so much. Do you much. remember that session? I can remember one where Al, where I was commenting on Charles Mills, and Alison Jagger came up to me, and she said, "Why are you so invested in ontology and metaphysics?" <laughs> that it was, was the dynamic. <laughs> yeah, right. 
Does everyone, do people either have a handout or have uh, access to one over somebody's shoulder? There's a row back here. I think they need to go back in that direction and the wait, 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 no, row back over there. So if, I think, um, if you don't need a handout, then pass it back. That's <laughs> because that's where, oh, here's some more. Okay, here's some more, good. Here's some more. Okay, as I said, it's just an outline. It's not, there's not a lot, nothing on the handout that you won't see on the screen. But also you can scribble on it and then it's a party favor that you can take home. Isn't that cool? Okay. So thank you all for coming. It's a really honor, a real honor to be here um, and to be part of this workshop. You all can find a seat. My biggest worry is I'm going to go over too long. There's one more chair here. We don't have to put it right there. We can make it a little easier to manage by putting it right here. All good? Everybody all good? Okay, let's go. Um, so, thank you, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so here's my outline. Um, I'm gonna have a short introduction. Then I'm going to talk about, ID oh, I should say, going back, I changed the title. It was Situated Knowledges and Situated Values, and I am still talking about Situated Values, but I decided as I was, I've given this talk before, but I'm, going, I'm trying to revise it um, for a, a book that's going to be revision of my Benjamin lectures that I gave in Berlin this summer. And this is a variation on my second lecture because I'm trying to, it was better for this group, but also I have to revise um, the material anyway. So I'm really looking forward to your input. And I decided to change it to critical standpoints because that's what I'm really trying to contrast, situated knowledge and critical standpoints. So I'll start with an introduction and then I'll talk about ideology and ideology critique. Then this third section, for those of you who know my recent work, <clears throat> it's gonna be really boring, because I'm just saying, you know, giving you some of the tools and ideas that I've been working on for a while. Um, so you can go to sleep then, and then wake up again if you want. And then I'm going to talk about the path dependency of value, and I'm then going to turn to social change through co-design, which is going to talk about um, a couple of projects that I'm very involved with, one of them in, in Kenya, and then I'll draw the conclusion. Okay, so introduction. Um, as I read the Anglophone literature on standpoint epistemology, there's often a conflation of situated knowledge and critical standpoints. In this lecture, I'm going to start by situating standpoint epistemology within the critical theory tradition and explore the challenges that arise in achieving a critical standpoint. So I started off you know, doing analytic metaphysics, and now I'm over in Berlin doing critical theory, European critical theory. So it's like, whoa! And, and in the middle, I was doing like critical race theory and you know, critical queer theory and all, of, and all of that, disability studies. And now I'm kind of like a, an octopus or something with many arms in many places. And so this part of this is trying to say, well, let's talk to these two different parts talking to each other. Um, so I want to ask, what is a critical standpoint and how is it different from situated knowledge? And why are critical standpoints important? What do they give us epistemically? So in European critical theory, a critical standpoint, oh, and I, I talked once when I was um, in Europe, I was talking about the American use of the term critical theory and the European use of the term critical theory. And they said, oh, you're getting geographical now. And I was going, no, no, it's just, it's just traditions, it's just traditions. Um, a critical standpoint is a site that provides resources for ideology critique. Its primary goal is liberation rather than objective knowledge. I really do think that this, if you're interested in this dimension of it, um, Raymond Goyce's book, The Idea of a Critical Theory, very important. I'll start by sketching how critical theory views this task of, of doing ideology critique, and then say a bit about one method for building new paradigms together that, address, that addresses um, some of the epistemic and moral challenges that arise for ideology critique. Okay, so this is just a framing of two different approaches. It's of course going to be simplistic, but I think you'll get the point. 
So in the context of feminist philosophy of science and epistemology more generally, feminist epistemology more generally, decades of work have been devoted to emphasizing the value of situated knowledge. Much of the work takes place against a background concerned with scientific conditions for epistemic adequacy and objectivity. The emphasis on situated knowledge is central to feminist empiricism and its critique of traditional empiricism. Feminist empiricism foregrounds how science is a social practice, that it is value laden and context sensitive. So I find Intamin's paper who's trying to look at the critical standpoints view and situated knowledge view and see if they really differ, um, that those are some of the distinctive features of feminist empiricism that she draws attention to. Situated knowledge is knowledge accessible to those who occupy a certain social position, and this knowledge can be communicated to those who do not occupy the social position, but it is best more difficult for them to access it directly. And this, of course, has been a huge site of controversy, and Ladal has written on this and others as well. And I'm not going to take a stand on that. If handled properly, situated knowledge contributes to the objectivity of science. OK. So feminist emphasis on situated knowledge is, I see it, a crucial part of ideology critique. I talk about this some in a paper in Oxford Studies in Political Philosophy and the importance of having a conception of, uh, of situated knowledge and, and you know, critical social science to be able to do ideology critique. Um, but situated knowledge does not do the same work in ideology critique as a critical standpoint. So this is a lot of what I'm trying to argue today. So now let's move to the critical theory side of it. In contrast, in the context of critical theory, decades of work have been devoted to exploring the possibility of a critical standpoint. It provides the tools to engage in ideology critique. The point, first and foremost, is liberation and not scientific objectivity. So one of the things Goyce talks about is the difference between a descriptive theory and an emancipatory theory. And he's going like, whoa, what do you mean emancipatory? How can a theory be emancipatory? And of course, no one is saying that the theory alone is emancipatory. But think about Marx, right? Whoa, that shifted a paradigm of what was going on in the labor contract, right? And of course, just knowing that that's what's going on in the labor contract does not change labor condi the conditions of labor, but it is radically transformative of a perspective that you suddenly shift your way of thinking about the world and your, ag your actions and your agency. That kind of paradigm shift, I think, is what is crucial in doing ideology critique. In order to be successful, a critical theory must not only meet the ordinary epistemic standards, it must be emancipatory, it must break through ideology to give us a better sense of how we might better organize ourselves to flourish under just conditions. According to critical theory, epistemology is not just giving us tools to report on how the world is, but tools to become different kinds of subjects, right? So we're not going to continue, so what happens when you are a worker uh, in a labor contract is, you know, you, under ideology is, as Alter, Althusser would say, and we'll talk about this, is you just think this is what you got to do and this is who you are and your, your goal is to, you know, get through the day and get your paycheck. But once you've read Marx, that's not, you're not that social subject anymore. You are a different kind of social subject. And so that's what ideology critique does. Situated knowledge from a particular social position is typically not critical in the sense needed, I think, because we are interpolated as social subjects to participate in the systems that oppress us. I'm going to talk quite a bit about this. Um, and a critical standpoint, so it's essential, that situated knowledge is essential, but it's not enough. It's not always and, and typically is not critical. Um, so we'll go on. So to give you the background a bit about the frame of the critical theory task is this. Um, <clears throat> this is, says, pyramid of capitalist system. And it's like, uh, wait a minute, we work for all, we feed all, we eat for you. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know if you've ever seen this. This pyramid really good. OK. To, in order to address pressing issues of social justice, we need to better understand the social domain. 
Designing just laws and fair economic institutions is not enough. Societies are structured systems that sustain themselves over time. How do they do so? One way, interpolation. That's, that's Althusser's word. One is hailed into social practices or roles that one learns to enact fluently. So you come to see yourself as a worker or as um, an aristocrat or as a soldier, etc. So the reproduction of unjust social formations lies crucially on ideology. I'm going to use the term ideology in a pejorative, functional, but not doxastic sense. So most people, when they think of ideology, they think of propositions, a set of background beliefs. That's not my view. Um, or at least it's not only background beliefs. Um, I also use ideology in the pejorative sense, or what some people prefer to say the critical sense, is that a culture is ideological insofar as it has this function of perpetuating injustice and oppression, right? So it's a pejorative notion of ideology. So here's Stuart Hall. On his view, ideology has especially to do with the concepts and languages of practical thought, which stabilize a particular form of power and domination, or which reconcile and accommodate the mass of the people to their subordinate place in the social formation. Ideology critique has to do with the process by which new forms of consciousness, new conceptions of the world arise, which move the masses of the people into historical action against the prevailing system. Now, he means by consciousness here not like, like David Chalmers' consciousness. He means a practical consciousness, a way of engaging in the world with race consciousness. Right? That's what, in raising consciousness, it's about that kind of consciousness, I believe. It's not just about having new qualia or whatever. OK, sorry. OK, so repression is coercive, so people are forced to perform um, their social roles. Ideological oppression, we just love it. We love our social roles. It gives us meaning and a sense of self. And I'm not, I'm, I'm a little sarcastic here because the picture is sarcastic, but we're all in this position. We all do this all the time, right? This is ideological oppression. And a Foucauldian term is that we are docile bodies. We have learned to cooperate in the system and not question it and even identify with our, our role, identifying with our um, gender or our race or our um, ability status, et cetera, like that. There is hybrid, where I think this individual, the black man in the middle, is being repressed. There's no ideological uh, uh, oppression there. But the cops who are holding him in place are, are ideologically dominating the person, that's their identity, that's their sense of themselves, that they're going to be good cops, right? And Les Mis is a kind of interesting example of this. There's a lot of, a lot of stuff in there about that. OK, so here's an example of gender ideology, Sandra Barkey. She points out ideological oppression is characteristic of gender. I think it's much more characteristic of gender than of race, especially in this moment in history. Um, and certain others. So I use gender as a paradigm example because it is so deep. Women's bodies are constrained by norms specifying size, shape, motility, and appearance. She wrote this in 1990, but I think it's still somewhat true today. A woman's skin must be soft, supple, hairless, and smooth. Ideally, it should betray no sign of wear, experience, age, or deep thought. This is not usually achieved directly by coercion. Under surveillance, we do it to ourselves voluntarily. So how many people, how many women haven't looked in the mirror? Well, some of you aren't old enough to say, oh, it's wrinkling, it's sagging, or whatever, or trying to sort of, how much, how much of a jelly roll do I really have? You know, these are, these are self-surveilling techniques that even if we brush them aside, we know them well, right? I'm assuming. Maybe you all are so much younger than I am. It doesn't affect you at all, but oh my god. Okay. Um, so uh, she says, the absence of formal institutional structure and of authorities invested with the power to carry out institutional directives creates the impression that the production of femininity is either entirely voluntary or natural because no one has to coerce us to order a salad rather than the pasta, right? That's just, that's just how gender works. Okay, 
So um, if our social practices and corresponding practical orientations are shaped by ideology, how is critique possible? Because our consciousness is ideologically informed, right? And we're in it. We're living it. We're doing it. We're performing it all the time. So how do you get a, 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 sp a space, a perspective from which you can do critique? That's the, the standard um, critical theory dilemma or question. So the, and again, this is the dilemma. If we rely on beliefs and values that aren't broadly accepted in the social context, our critique will be at best ineffective and at most paternalistic. So you kind of parachute in and you say, you all are totally deluded about what's in your best interest. And you go, what? Go away. You know, you don't know anything about anything. We don't want to do that. Or the internal, if we rely on beliefs and values that are internal to the ideology, internal uh, to the ideology, to the ideology, okay, comma, <laughs> critique is unlikely to identify the wrongs adequately. So if we're kind of stuck in the practices and in the perspective of the ideology, then it's hard to see where critique comes from. This is the standard. Not mine, this is not my, because I'm gonna say this is not the right dilemma to worry about, but this is the standard dilemma. So there are some challenges that this is getting at, though. The normative challenge, and I get this um, from a paper by Robin Selicates criticizing me, but the normative challenge is, are there objective moral truths by reference to which we can judge social arrangements to be unjust? You know, so whether they're internal or external, you know, how do we make a judgment about what is good or bad in terms of social arrangements? From what standpoint does the critic speak? So even if we are only speaking to the subordinated, they disagree, right? <laughs> the subordinated don't all say, yes, we all agree with Marx, or we all agree with Butler, right? <laughs> no, it doesn't work that way. So there has to be a selection there. And if a cultural techne, and I haven't really introduced that yet, have I? Anyway, it's not a set of propositions. So if the ideology is not a set of propositions, what epistemic resources are available to evaluate it. So part of my view is it's not all about beliefs and propositions. There's more to an ideology than that. But we don't have anything in epistemology, pretty much, except for Gru. Oh, don't worry about Gru. Okay, except for Gru to say, well, you know, we, that was a critique of a predicate. Interesting. Most epistemology is not critiques of predicates, but okay. It's a critique of propositions and belief. Well, I don't, I'm not, that's not where I am with ideology. I'm trying to think about ideology a bit differently. Okay, so my response very roughly is to answer these, and I'll say more, is we rely on an oppositional standpoint achieved through consciousness raising to offer an alternative paradigm that is empirically sound and more just as a basis of social coordination. So I think, you know, if you're having an, a, a difficulty understanding what I'm even talking about, I think that you could look at Marx, not that I embrace all of Marx, but there's a kind of consciousness raising that you get through reading Marx, for example, um, that gives you an alternative economic paradigm that in, you know, if all were good, it would be empirically sound and also more just. Okay. I'm, again, I'm not trying to do Marx theory here, you know, or defend Marx in all its respects, but I'm trying to give you a sense of what I'm talking about. Okay, this is the part that's review of other things I've done. So any human behavior. So now we're going to talk about, so here I talked about ideology, and then the question is going to be, okay, so we're interpolated into these social positions. We come to think and see and emote and interact using the ideology, and so um, what we're gonna have to do is find a way to critique how we're living our lives, the kind of social subjects we are. We're trying to crit critique our very social subjecthood. Um, and so the first thing to do, in my view, is to say, well, how do we get there anyway? Right? What is the process by which we are, so to speak, interpolated? Ah, uh, okay, so any human behavior is conditioned by multiple factors, so suppose we're I'm going to sit down to eat uh, the physical demands of the human body, the geographical context and the edible things in it, the social, political, legal context that makes certain edibles salient, available, or safe. So, you know, federal uh, 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 departments that are responsible for, you know, allowing certain things to be sold as food, et cetera. Um, the economic constraints on what we can afford 
and the social meaning of the different foodstuffs. So, for example, if you're going to plan a wedding reception, you're probably not going to have hot dogs, right? Probably. You might. Depends on your, your again, the economic con uh, constraints. But it would seem weird. Like when Trump, when he was celebrating the, um, the Clemson football team who won the NCAA uh, football championship, uh, he invited them to the White House to a banquet where he f served fast food, right? McDonald's and Burger King. And people were like, whoa! And he says, well, they'll probably like it better because this is the food they're used to. Oh, my God. Anyway, anyway, but it was inappropriate, right? But it wasn't inappropriate. Well, it's not very good for you, so the physical demands of the human body, fast food's not so great. But the social meaning was off, right? All the alarm bells went off. Okay, so we're going to talk about social meaning because social meaning is, for me, the site where ideology gets a hold on us. So coordination around resources, which I mean by that, things of positive or negative value. And I acknowledge that resource makes it seem like positive value. But this is a tradition that I'm in going back to Giddens. And I don't want to have to change the language completely because it's hard to find a better word. OK, so resources could be toxic waste, right? Um, or lead in the water or whatever. Anyway. Um, so coordination around that is a fundamental human task and our ability to develop flexible forms of coordination that can be passed down through social learning <clears throat> is the key to our evolutionary success. And social learning is the, where I want to differentiate um, the social domain from the, from the non-social domain. So communities that pass down information and knowledge and skills um, across generationally and don't have to wait for evolution, those are social species, right? And, and lots and lots of species, birds are social species, you know, bees are social species, you know, in this sense. So I have a very broad notion of the social. So coordination relies on meaning, symbols, default assumptions, and associations, and that's what I call a cultural techne. It's a set of tools. So it's not a kind of hegemonic sort of sense of reality. It's a set of tools that we use in differently in different contexts. We not only learn what is edible, but develop cuisines, menus, daily and holiday rituals. So there's this beautiful cedar waxwing who just any red round berry, boom, didn't have to learn from its mom and dad to eat little red round things. It just does it. And it does it even if it's a bead. It tries a red bead on the ground. It will try to eat it, and then it'll spit it out because it can't swallow it, etc. cetera. Um, but humans, we have to learn which berries, right? We don't, we don't know what berries to eat. So on my account, an ideology is a cultural technique gone wrong. It obscures or distorts what is valuable and or organizes us in unjust ways. And so these social meanings and the default assumptions and such that we rely on as we develop our cuisines and menus and such, that's the cultural techne. So the cultural techne, on my view, that says meat, yummy, you know, this stuff, which is actually dead animal flesh, that we have language that we insert is called meat, so we're not saying dead animal flesh every time we eat it, and then says, this is, makes good food, ideology, right? That's my view. Those terms, that misleading language, et cetera. You know, I'm not judgy about you if you eat meat, but me, no. I have been a vegetarian since 1970. So, you know, <clears throat> I'm sorry. I think that's ideological. OK, so it distorts what is valuable. We don't understand. We, we misconstrue what is valuable or not. And it organizes us in ways that we have industrial agriculture and destroy the world. Anyway, not, not, yo, I'm, it's not if I'm, as if I'm like opinionated here or anything, but. <clears throat> okay, so here we are. We're trying to coordinate. It's like, whoa, you know. So here's the picture. There's a cultural techne, or if it's gone wrong, it's an ideology. Here's the stuff in the world. And we sort of have these concepts or ideas or frames that we can use to try and understand what this thing is. And so the practice is going to be built up from that. Because what we do is we internalize these schemas and this language and stuff like that. It, it filters what we can see, what we can experience. 
that enables us to have you know, the, the content of our attitudes, then we interact, and that blue line should have been in front, but I couldn't get it there. Anyway, it, 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 it affects how we act on the thing, and then that reinforces the social meaning. So for a bunny, you know, around here, we don't tend to eat them or skin them, um, but we make them big and fat and slow because we want them as pets, and they don't run away then, right? Um, or we see them as, you know, these things that are eating our cabbages, or et cetera. And so that affects our, and then we, it reinforces, et cetera, in a loop. So here's another <clears throat> set of possible um, ways of viewing a, a, a person as a friend, a mother, or a sex object, or another person as a friend, a janitor, or a criminal. And that, and that is there's this looping effect because if you see someone as a criminal and treat someone as a criminal and then incarcerate them, you know, and then deny them resources, they may need to commit crime to survive. I mean, there's going to be looping. So this is on the handout too. Social practices are patterns of learned behavior that at least in the primary instances enable us to coordinate as members of a group in creating, distributing, managing, maintaining, and eliminating a resource or multiple resources due to mutual responsiveness to each other's behavior and the resources in question as interpreted through these shared meanings. Okay, so what happens is that we are shaped by the cultural techne to see things, experience things, um, to form certain kinds of attitudes and habitual responses, etc. So this is how ideology works. It gets inside of us. We enact it, we perform it in a Butlerian kind of sense without having to think about it because social fluency is extremely valuable. You don't want to have to deliberate about every single thing you did. So I bet none of you deliberated about whether you would sit on this table during the talk, right? You are fluent academics. You know that you're supposed to sit down and turn off your phone and get out your pencils or whatever. And that fluency has saved you a lot of trouble in your life <laughs> because you, we are, we're fluent in all kinds of things, like how to use utensils and stuff like that. So where are the levers for social change? I th uh, so change, does changing minds, for example, correcting explicit bias change the system? I think it's a very weak process of changing the system because you can change your attitude here, but then you're going to have to go back and participate in the practice to coordinate with other people, right? You can, if you don't, you can get punished, right, simply. And, so you, and you have this fluency that's already there, and so you default to that fluency. So it's not that helpful. So to change social practices, our aim should be to change the semiotic or the material conditions. Um, and I think sometimes you can change individuals, and especially if they're especially charismatic, et cetera, that helps. Look, the blue line came in front. That's good. Okay. So ideology critique specifically takes aim at the cultural techne, and in doing so, reorients our practical orientation vis-a-vis -vis the world. This, in turn, could change the structures and entrenched systems formed by the practices. Because if, whoops, sorry, go back, go back. Okay. Okay, if, if, if it changes this, what's available as our understanding of this, and you suddenly, food is out, pelt is out, wild animal and pet are the only things, then that changes the practices that are available to us, our understanding ourselves in the world. Okay, so, um, so this in turn could change the structures and entrenched systems formed by the practices, but then, of course, we should ask, how do we change, and on what basis, or do we legitimately change the cultural techne? Okay, I'm, I'm running a little slow. Am I talking too fast? Anyone find me talking too fast? Okay, I'll speed it up. No, just <laughs> Okay, path dependency, so social justice. When seeking social justice, it's important to keep in mind that there are many acceptable ways to organize social life. The goal is not to ask what practices are the best way and critique any that fall short. For example, we need not assume the best way to organize meals is to have traditional breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Three meals a day, three square meals a day. No, 
right? That's not, that's not what we need to decide when we're doing social theory. You don't, you don't say, oh, there's one best way to organize, organize meals, right? So it's very different, I think, this is one of my little bit of gesture toward a much bigger debate. I think doing ideal theory in social theory and social philosophy is a little weird because, really? You think there's an ideal way for us to organize our meals? No, it's not really possible. So there's a kind of anti-utopianism built in. Nevertheless, some ways of producing and distributing food are unhealthy. Some exploit workers, some destroy ecosystems, some cause suffering and or death of sentient beings. And I think this means, and I said it on the handout, rectification is a priority because things have gotten really bad. A normative social theory provides tools to identify ways in which our current practices are inadequate so we can do better. But what counts as better will depend hugely on local factors, the geography, economy, history, cultural traditions, and human biology. So again, going back to food, you're, you're gonna ha if you're going to think you know, some ways of organizing food, of growing it and distributing it, et cetera, are really bad. But that doesn't mean there's one best way, and we all have to follow that one best way. So this is a different set of normative concerns than you get in ethics and political philosophy, I think. Also, it involves things like that, that the law can't prescribe. The law can't tell you what to serve for dinner, right? Not legitimately. So we're gonna, can't tell you, you know, whether to use chopsticks or, or forks and knives or your hands, right? So there's a, a domain of informal social practices that laws just can't help us. Good policy is not the solution. Okay, so my, one of my favorite <clears throat> authors on the social domain is Jack Balkin. He's a legal theorist at Yale. He has a book called Cultural Software. Um, and he says, values are not so much what humans have as what they do and feel. Human beings possess an inexhaustible drive to evaluate, to pronounce what is good and bad, beautiful and ugly, advantageous and disadvantageous. Without culture, human values are inchoate and indeterminate. Through culture, they become differentiated, articulated, and refined. It's not just that there may be different ways of exemplifying well-defined abstract rules or procedures. Rather, because our ultimate values are indeterminate, any attempt to render them determinate will be specific to cultural and material conditions, so may not be transposable. So I have this rock and roll band up there because he has the example of the aesthetic value of rock and roll, and he says there, there couldn't be a way of thinking about the aesthetic value of rock and roll until we had electric guitars, right? So technology can change our whole sensibility. And it changes our sensibility with robots, right? It changes our sensibilities. So the world that we're in changes our sensibilities and, and changes the possibilities of different ways of valuing. And that's part of the contextualism and the path dependency. So what happens is if, if you're trying to make music and you're in, in one part of the world, certain things are going to sound beautiful and creative and interesting, and in another part of the world, they're not. Certain instruments are going to sound terrible and others are going to sound beautiful because our sensibilities are very much affected by path dependency, about what instruments are typical there, about what history of music there is. And he argues that this is the same for moral values as well. So a cultural techne is an evolving and contested specification of our inchoate and indeterminate drive to evaluate in response to our material conditions. Contestation over meanings and what's in the techne is going to, of course, reflect struggles of power and conflicting interests. OK, so path dependency does not leave critique without normative resources. The fact that ultimate indeterminate values are often agreed upon across contexts, like do unto others as you would have them do unto you, is one of the paradigm examples that's often given. But there are these very high level, or reciprocity, you know, if someone gives you something, you should, you should reciprocate. Um, they're often agreed on a post context, and they can be a resource for critique, even though there's a tremendous disagreement at the lower level. I'm not saying it's all rosy, believe me. I know it's not all rosy. So here are some ways this is wrong, so social critique can draw on our inchoate and indeterminate sets of justice to demand a better alternative. 
this is so much better. Experiencing a different way of life due to travel crisis, its literature can reveal the default way of life is damaging um, and more fitting with our ultimate values. Why not here too? The, the fragmentation of our social practices and relative but incomplete autonomy of social systems generate tensions <clears throat> and contradictions that can prompt reflection. Well, my sister uh, was a stay-home mom for 10, 12 years, went back to work, um, and I said to her, I called her and I said, Mary, how do you like being at work? And she said, it's so interesting because at work, oh my God, I do the littlest thing, and everybody's going, yay, Mary, you're awesome. And I was saying, look at all I've done at home, and I've never said anybody, and heard anybody say I was awesome, right? You know, so she had two boys and, 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 a, and a husband who did not appreciate her. Um, and then she says, but you know, at work, I have to take my lunch break from 12 to 1, but I'm not, maybe not hungry, and at home, I could take my lunch break whenever I was hungry, right? Whenever I felt like it. So I had more flexibility. So here she is sort of looking at the work life, home life, you know, values and norms and expectations and using one to critique the other. Actually, in her workplace, she then organized, even though she's not really political, we kind of have it in our blood, I guess. Oh, but that's too bionormative. Anyway, so um, she organized and got uh, flex time for lunch, which I loved. I love that, you know, good. Um, this is unworkable. The point of coordination is to improve well-being, to achieve together what we couldn't do alone. When circumstances get very bad, it becomes clear that the terms of coordination are failing to even maintain basic well-being. And so, you know, we, we and in the, in, the Ger, in the German critical theory tradition, they call these contradictions. I always had trouble with that because, you know, when you grow up in analytic metaphysics, you're going, okay, there has to be a P and not P here. I don't see the contradiction. Anyway, I've learned... Chill out. It's a contradiction. <clears throat> OK. So just to rethink, remember the internal, external. Do you bring values from inside, or do you bring them from outside? Um, societies are not unified and hegemonic. They're fragmented. Social roles and practices are not well organized, and ideologies, meaning the cultural techne, these different tools, they have contradictory norms built into them. Social critique can, at the very least, draw on our inchoate and indeterminate sense of justice in its articulation in different contexts to construct and demand a better alternative to the current practices. The fragmentation of our social practices and relevant autonomy generate tensions and contradictions. So comparisons like my sister, but certainly like in Du Bois and, and um, Patricia Hill Collins and many others, these comparisons can illuminate different forms of life and, and reveal tensions that have to be um, better resolved. So this can prompt reflect reflection and a reconfiguration, I think, of our normative resources. However, individuals lose their bearings and sense of agency when their way of life is deeply challenged. A movement must be sensitive to the fact that practices are valuable and produce goods that are internal to the practice. Goods may accrue to the participants even if overall the structure is problematic and should be changed. So here's Bartke again. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to read the red because I'm, I want to be on closer to time. She says, feminism threatens women with a certain de-skilling, something that people normally resist. Beyond this, it calls into question that aspect of personal identity which is tied to the development of a sense of competence. So you might imagine you know, quilting bees or you know, um, practices of motherhood and, and identity built around collective uh, sharing of the responsibility of childcare and such like that. So loss of bearings uh, is something that you find often when you're engaged in ideology critique because you're suggesting this social subject that you are is problematic. And people freak out and go, what do you mean it's problematic? My whole life is structured around this, blah, 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 blah. What else am I supposed to do? Really, blah, 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 blah. OK, so <laughs> they don't really sound like that. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, epistemic foreclosure. So individuals and groups face epistemic foreclosure due to uncertainty about options and feasibility. Social practices have significant epistemic effects. The schemas we employ to interpret the world are confirmed by the world we have shaped. That's the looping, right? So you look around. And people who, who 
you know, are just looking, and this was what my uh, being objective and being objectified paper was about. If ideology has already shaped the world, and you look around as a good empiricist, your ideology is going to be confirmed, right? Because the ideology has shaped the world you're trying to describe. So good epistemic practices in the ordinary sense, ordin that's not good enough, right? Because you'll be describing the ideology back at you, right? That's not good enough, right? Okay. So um, it, does, it becomes difficult to even see that the schemas and practices are problematic because they appear to be warranted. I often say, yes, if you want a child, you want someone to take care of your child, best to pick a woman. Not because it's part of women's nature, but because women do most of the caregiving in this world, right? Almost all of it, of the babies, the young women, I mean, the young, the young children, the disabled, the elderly, whatever, they are good at it and they learned it from their mothers. Not everybody, you know, some people had shitty mothers, but you learn it from the culture, you know, what to do. So, yeah, women are better caregivers. I hold that. But that's ideology, too. It's true and ideological. Hmm. Okay. So, we allow Nestle to drain local springs in order to bottle water, leaving less potable public water supply giving people to reason to engage in the practice of drinking bottled water, thus reinforcing the decision to grant water rights to Nestle, right? Because they're providing clean water, having drained it out of the aquifer, right? So we, so we don't, you can't go and get clean water because Nestle has destroyed it um, in order to bottle it and sell it back to you. Okay, so this is a self-reinforcing system that provides reasons for people to act as they do, and it's hard to see a way out. Imagination and willingness to think and act beyond the immediate reality are needed. Okay, critical standpoints. Oh, I've gone 42 minutes. All right. Uh, there are many kinds of movements that address different circumstances in different communities. I'm going to sketch one appropriate approach to, one approach to organizing and argue it provides a way to change practices that it's sensitive to the past dependence of value and also addresses the loss of bearings and epistemic foreclosure. So D-Lab is a program I work and teach in at MIT, and it seeks to address global poverty challenges through co-design that is inclusive, accessible, and sustainable. And a substantial mo motivation for the program is to provide an alternative to standard force of neocolonial and neoliberal development. Traditional development programs have often assumed that liberalism and capitalism provide the only or the best frameworks for a good life, or more cynically, they seek to create new workers and new markets to exploit in the pursuit of corporate profit. I think the latter, actually. Such programs often impose top-down policies that are not well-informed about the local circumstances and are rightly regarded as paternalistic, ethnocentric, and extractive. Some claim to empower communities but have often a limited sense of local agency values or capabilities. And again, cynically, they often use the language of empowerment to recruit entrepreneurs to invest in communities for profit. Although development has a bad name, those in the global north and elsewhere, I believe, should also take some responsibility for the ongoing damage that is being done by global capitalism, patriarchy, and white supremacy. Doing nothing if you have the ability is not ethically defensible. There are local challenges also in the global north, and these should be addressed as well. The issue, to my mind, isn't about which social justice work is more important. It's about working where you and how you can to be effective and sustain your commitment. So the core strategy of D-Lab is, you've probably seen this, if you give someone a fish, they eat for a day, and you know, teach them to fish, they eat for like whatever. But notice even that isn't right, because you know, if their culture allows them to eat the fish you offer, no, I wouldn't eat it. Don't give me fish. I don't want to fish. Okay, if you teach someone to fish, they can feed themselves until the water is contaminated or the short line is ceased for development. If you teach someone to think critically and be politically conscious, then whatever, they, then whatever the challenge, they can organize with their peers and stand up for their interests. We're getting there. But if you also engage them in the design process, they become agents in changing the relationships, social norms, and material conditions. So this is, this is where we work. We're not opposed to the one about crit think critically and be politically conscious, but we want to give them power. OK, this is the design cycle. Um, I'm not going to go into it in detail. But what happens 
is you identify opportunities for improvement, gather information, define the challenge more clearly, think of ideas, choose the best idea, work out the de details, build a prototype, get feedback, and then uh, get opportunities. So you go around and around and iterate over and over. And CCB here is creative capacity building. This is used in a lot of different design programs, but the one at MIT is called creative capacity building. So this is Amy Smith. She uh, won a MacArthur many years ago. She was just a lecturer in material um, in uh, mechanical engineering, and she got a MacArthur, and she formed D-Lab. And her most famous quote is, impact is not just the product of innovation, but the process of innovation. So um, I've chosen to focus on public narrative and co-design in order to highlight how they can be used to address the loss of bearings and epistemic foreclosure. Loss of bearings is where you don't want to change because you're kind of stuck. And epistemic foreclosure is you don't see how, because the world presents itself to you, is supporting what you're doing. As I understand it, consciousness raising is not something you do to someone, but with others. It's a collective process by which a desiring negation is transformed into a justified complaint and ultimately a demand. And Iris Young decide, describes it this way. Desire creates the distance, the negation that opens the space for criticism of what is. This critical distance does not occur on the basis of some previously discovered rational ideas of the good and the just. On the contrary, the ideas of the good and the just arise from the desiring negation that action brings to what is given. And so this, I think, is part of the path dependency, right? So that you're going, oh, not this. This is not working. So there's that. Crit and then you try to figure out what might work, but within the context of your milieu, you're trying to figure out what could work better. Each social reality presents its own unrealized possibilities, experienced as lacks and desires. Norms and ideals arise from the yearning that is an expression of freedom. It does not have to be this way. It could be otherwise. So Marshall Gans is at the Kennedy School at Harvard, and he's a social movement um, theorist. And he says, movements have narratives. They tell stories, because they're not just about rearranging economics and politics. They also rearrange meaning. And they're not just about redistributing the goods. They're about figuring out what is good. Okay, So it's not, it's not just descriptive, I think, that you're know, figuring out about what is good. He doesn't mean by that tracking moral reality. You know, that's not how he's thinking about it. He's thinking about reconstructing ourselves and our sense of value and re-manifesting re re our inchoate values in concrete ways. So on Gans's view, public narrative is valuable because it, valuable because it enables participation, participants to connect values with action. So he has this methodology, story of self, story of us, story of now. <clears throat> narrative is not talking about values. Rather, narrative embodies and communicates those values. It's through the shared experience of our values that we can engage with others, motivate one another to act, and find the courage to take risks, explore possibility, and face the challenges that we must face. So the first is, the first step, people come together and narrate a story of self that shares the individual's experience with the challenge and, and the values that have made a difference for them at important choice points. This isn't just spontaneous outpouring. They're given tools to think about their experiences, identify choice points, and find values. So I'm going to talk about the Kenya project a little bit more. But in Kenya, in the area of Kenya we work, it's Western Kenya. There's terrible food insecurity. About 30% of the women have HIV. They, um, about 25% of teens have already had uh, uh, childbirth, have already given birth to a child. In the data that we collected last year, there was one woman at 22. She already had seven children. Many of, the, many of them who have children are 14 and 15, you know, even younger, 13, 14, 15. Um, they have no menstrual products. They have no sex ed when, when girls start their period. Um, they don't know what's happening to them. Um, they're ashamed and afraid. Um, and they have no menstrual products to sort of stem the flow, so to speak. Um, so they drop out of school because the schools have no bathrooms and they have no, no way to manage menstruation, and you don't go to school with blood running down your legs. That's not a good look. And so they drop out of school. They're unsupervised. They stay at home. 
They're subject to incest um, and rape. They then have children, um, and uh, the children they can't support. And more evidence we've gotten from doing the analysis of this data is often they have sex, again, to make money, to have the money to feed their children. They don't have contraceptives. They don't understand, you know, they don't have sex ed, so they get pregnant again, right? This is bad. This is very bad. And so we've been working with them through DLAB for about, about uh, five years. Um, and in the story of self, we go in in a creative capacity building workshop, and we have... Um, these, are, these are high school girls talk about their first menstrual period. And they've never talking about, talked to anyone about it before, right? We, get, we prime the pump a little bit, get some people to start. And then they have this outpouring of their fear, their shame, their anxiety, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so that story of self is just each of them telling their story. And if you look at work on consciousness raising, this is a standard method for consciousness raising. OK, so then after everyone listens to the stories of self from others, they collectively create a story of us that connects the experiences and the values of the participants. So why did you make this choice not to go to school? Why did you make this choice you know, to have sex with someone? You know, why did you do this and do this? And they start to kind of come up with a story of self that is an analysis of the circumstances of their choices, right? It talks about what is constraining their choices and what is opening up possibility. Um, this is a scaffolded project that shows participants how to compare their different social positions and how those positions are related. Um, the story of now is they come together, they have this, and then they, they try to figure out what they're gonna do. So in a story of now, we are the protagonists, and it's our choices that shape the outcome. We draw on our moral sources. These are the inchoate sensibilities, I think, to find the courage, hope, and empathy to respond. It can take several meetings of the group to develop, rounds of feedback and revision. But the goal is to articulate the urgent choice faced by us that requires action, a challenging vision of what will happen if we do not act, a hopeful vision of what, we, what could be if we do act, and a call to choose commitment to the action required. The choice we offer must be more than, oh, we must all choose to be better people, or we must all choose to do any one of these 53 things. A meaningful choice requires action we can take now, action we can take together, and an outcome we can achieve. So one of the things that the high school girls decided is they wanted to make posters and hang them in the school to tell other girls about menstruation. And then they wanted to put more posters in the lower level, in the, not the high schools, but the middle schools, about menstruation. If you start bleeding, you are not dying. You know, <laughs> things like this. If you start bleeding, you can go to someone and ask, and these people are happy to talk to you about it. You know, so it was this immediate outpouring of, of energy to do this. Um, and it was, I mean, this is what I said, this is one of those ideal paradigm shifts, no longer are they alone? No longer is something happening to them. No longer are they helpless, but they have an analysis of what was going wrong and why that was a bad thing and how they can change it. Okay, so this is, this is also what they did. They designed, we helped them in a process of designing. These, this was um, uh, period panties and menstrual pads and wet bags that they could use so they could take them to school and change their menstrual pad at school and not wreck their backpacks or whatever. OK, I'm not going to talk about this. Is my, there's my co-teacher, Libby. She works. It's not just objects that we create, but movements. And she's created a union. And anyway, so the method for teaching the design cycle involves several elements not described in the figure of that, of that circle. Um, OK, I'm already after. And we have to be out of here by 6.30 sharp. OK. I'm going to, uh, OK, so OK, really quickly, you have to look for the stakeholders. You have to think outside the box. This is an exercise we do with two pieces of paper and bananas. What can you use in new ways? What hands-on skills do you need? Uh, the emphasis is on solutions that can be designed and implemented with what's at hand. It can involve training from welding to sewing, computer coding to brick making. And then later, participants use the skills in their homes in a way that promotes affordability, sustainability, and local control. So they were using rubber to make sandals, and then they found that they could use mesquite flour 
and et cetera, to do it instead. So <clears throat> this is all so cool, but I'm going to go to my conclusion because it sort of summarizes. OK, so why are structural and systemic injustice so hard to combat? Because they're embedded in complex social systems that are self-organizing and self-sustaining. What critical interventions can make a difference? Changes in agency, culture, and material conditions that make up the practices that structure the system. How does co-design help? At least in some cases, situated knowers gain a critical standpoint by collectively creating alternative practices that produce new forms of value that enhance capabilities and are, to the best of our knowledge, determinations of our indeterminate sense of justice. The important question remains, however, and I also think it addresses loss of bearings because, and that was in the slides I went too fast over, but you're not left with, someone just told me how I'm doing things doesn't work and it's bad. What am I going to do now? What you're doing is creating new practices and new activities with others, and you're doing it together, and you're deciding how to make it work. It also addresses issues of epistemic foreclosure because you see objects in the world as, as tools and possibilities um, that produce more imaginative sense of what's, what's available and what could be done. And so I think both of those are really important. The important question remains whether <clears throat> and when local changes can build on each other to create really transformative change. Like we want to take down global capitalism, right? So really, is this going to do it? Menstrual pads? OK, I hear you. Really, I do. Um, in Kenya, SEP, the organization we work with, Society Empowerment Project, has developed multiple projects to empower girls and women. It's been successful in supporting girls as they continue in school and earn college degrees. These are important steps towards status and recognition in the community that can give them influence in local decision making. But even more evidence suggests that when women hold office in local communities, they're more likely to work to increase provision of public services and improve perceptions of women as leaders. So there's some, some broader transformative potential. Um, this is a great picture. So here are these kids. And that's a picture of a uterus and the ova and menstruation, blood. You know, they're, they're these girls who are there trying to draw on the board and figure out what their bodies are like and what's going on inside. And here, this is the, one of the teams. They have soccer teams that they work with. And they, they have developed um, a, an SMS number, a text number, that you can call if you are being subject or vulnerable to sexual violence. And these are their practice jerseys. So they've gone from, now they're a, te they're a team, they're strong, they're you know, awesome, and, um, and this is transformative. I think this is transformative um, to the community. So uh, for the purposes of the talk, my focus has been on the importance of developing a collective critical standpoint Although this draws on situated knowledge, it goes beyond that to critique what we know and what we value to create new ways of living together. So again, I want to emphasize it's about creating new social subjects. It's not just representing the world. It's making a new world. And that's what I think the, the critical theory is trying to point to, is how ideology critique is transformative and emancipatory. Um, so ideology critique in this context is not just a theory. It's a practice of collectively reinventing our vocabularies and norms, our material conditions, and our social selves from a critical standpoint. 